I'm very uh, pleased to be here. And I'm also very pleased by the organization of the symposium, specifically the focus on outcomes of metabolomics and interpretation of metabolomics and not just about technologies. In this realm, I'd like to give you a new hypothesis on organelle dysfunction from plasma metabolomic data of MECFS patients. MECFS is myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome, and this has not been recognized for 50 years as a disease. Patients were suffering and they were going from doctor to doctor and they were basically told just to sleep it off and not complain too much about it. About three years ago, the NIH at the United States has, for the first time, given a large grant to different consortia to look into what is the, not only the symptoms of MECFS, but maybe also causes. So I have given here two patients and their pain that they endure. So overall, of course, they have different symptoms. Their diagnosis is based on the accumulation of eight different types of sim symptoms. Typically, all MECFS patients have extreme exhaustion after even very moderate exercise, exercise that can be as mild as standing up and leaning against a wall. That is already exercise in these patients. Blood pressure drops um, so that they often have to lie down again. They also um, complain about uh, severe muscle pains and aches and brain fog. Brain fog, something like difficulty thinking clearly, difficulty finding words, but also it can go as far as being sensitive to light sound and smell so that the patients are confined to the bed in uh, the basement often, you know, having muscle weakness and not being able to walk. So the overall diagnosis is difficult. There is no treatment and the causes are unclear. Obviously no um, animal models exist. It might be perhaps viral. It might be associated with other comorbidities. It's fairly prevalent with about 20 million people suffering worldwide. The NIH estimates the prevalence in the United States to be 0.8 for 1,000 people. Homebound are 25% of the people, 75% of the patients cannot leave the house and cannot go to work. So, so what we did here to get the first instances and, and ideas about metabolism of these MECFS is we had two case control studies. The first one I want to call the Nagy Sagal cohort we published in 2018, did the data acquisition in 2017 with 50 cases and 50 controls from four different US locations. Control subjects uh, were frequency matched with cases on sex, age, geographic location, race, BMI, and season of sample collection, but they were not matched by self-reported inflammatory bowel disease which we now more co call GI comorbidity, gut intestinal tract, because it's not necessarily IBS. So 24 MECFS patients, but only one control had IBS. I republished that in scientific reports two years ago. We used three untargeted metabolomic assays, salipidomics, biogenic amines, primary metabolites, and one targeted on oxalipins. And the total at that time, that's uh, three years ago, we had 562 identified compounds and unknowns. This year, we completed another study that we call this the R56 cohort, where we now have 907 identified compounds, and these are unique identified, no overlaps. For 106 cases and 91 controls from five different locations, again, matched as be, uh, before, but also, again, not matched for, ME, uh, for IBS diagnosis where only three controls had IBS. And the reason is IBS is not that frequent. It's not easy, easy to find those control subjects. Unpublished, just want to report this. In 2016, there was a paper by Navio et al. where they used direct and a certain technique. And we were asked to validate the data. We got the exact same samples that Navio had, and we could not replicate his data. So we think metabolomics and techniques and the quality control of these techniques is still very important. Ongoing, we have another study on 50 cases and 50 controls pre and post exercise. And as you can imagine for MECFS patients, it's really tough to do any type of exercise. Let's go into the results of the study. In the first cohort by using classic statistics, that's non-parametric non whitney u and adjusted univariate logistic regressions at point P05. We saw a lot of differences in, you know, decreased compounds, including tryptophan metabolites, carnitines, 
also carnitine related like butyrobetaine uh, compounds, but mostly decreases in uh, ranges of lipids and some increases also in, in specific lipids. When we would combine these tools or these, these markers uh, for a receiver operating characteristic curve, we would have a diagnostic area under the curve of 0.82. It's not brilliant, but it's good. But that was not the question. The question was, can we utilize such data to get an idea of underlying mechanisms? First of all, we, you know, use this study also to differentiate MECF patients with IBS compared to those without IBS. And we had obviously some markers that were just based on behavior differences. For example, of course, many MECFS patients are depressed or show a depression on top of everything. So we see these differences caused by their own drug uses here in uh, tryptophan metabolites, but also they take off the vitamins and we can and see these kind of vitamin doses. We also see decreases in very specific phosphatidylcholines and in plasmologens, these are PPCs. So where we have differences specifically in compounds that have a high number of unsaturations. We see also increases in specific triacylglycerides, not all triacylglycerides, specifically again for long chain um, fatty acids with a high degree of unsaturation. Interestingly, with respect to patients with IBS, we see increases in ceramides and in fossil ethanolamines, but only in that group that had, had IBS. So that was also something that was reported in the Navio report, but we could not, you know, we, we think this has more to do with IBS than with MECFS. What you can then do is you can group these compounds together and ask how likely is it that all the total number of metabolites within a chemical set is enriched. And the idea to use a chemical set enrichment is that A, you can look at all metabolites, not just pathway-related metabolites. So keg uh, is specifically weak, for example, in lipid analysis. And secondly, you do not suffer from the overall uh, false discovery rate adjustments that you would have in Bonferroni or Benjamin Hofberg adjustments. So what we see here is that in, in set enrichments, we see differences in carnitines and phosphatidylcholines, but even for the triacylglycerides, we only saw very specific TGs increased in that cohort, not even reaching, re reaching 0.05. So the question was, what else can we do? So we now went to the second cohort and started again with classic statistics on the second cohort. Again, it's about 100 patients versus 100 controls. We see very similar uh, differences here with regression uh, FDR corrected at 0.15 for plasmalogens, but also metabolic mediators like sphingomyelins, lots of membrane lipids, phosphatidylcholines, but also now differences in metabolic mediators, including drugs, acetaminophen, because of the pain exposure markers, you know, because patients change their dietary treatments uh, themselves, they eat differently compared to controls, and also, of course, metabolic mediators like oxylipids, and here's resolving one. So we thought, now that cannot be all, we can't just do regression analysis, and I would like you to introduce another way to do statistics in metabolomics. And we looked at the literature, it's never been done, and we don't really know why. Uh, this is Bayesian statistics. And Bayesian statistics complements classic null hypothesis statistics, ANOVA or t-test and so on. But the point is Bayesian statistics gives you not, it gives you strengths of evidence in favor or even against a hypothesis. It uh, can also be used by including prior data. So prior data being hypotheses that you have either from the literature or from other studies. So that changes the distribution of expectations. And then you do not need any more multiple testing corrections because it's each compound would have its own distribution. When we do this and we now apply Bayesian statistics and Bayesian factors for this second cohort, we first of all see that many, many compounds, the most compounds actually, have no indication of differences in MECFS patients to controls, strong or very strong or moderate 
evidence in favor of the null hypothesis, meaning no difference. However, we have quite a number of compounds that have um, strong, moderate, or anecdotal evidence in favor of being different. And when we look at these compounds, again, first of all, we see the same compounds that we had with classic statistics. Base factors more than three are strong factors, plasmologens, membrane lipids, and again, the same metabolic mediators, but now also PGF2, another mediator, but more plasmologens, membrane lipids, mitochondrial markers, metabolic mediators, and exposure markers on the, in this, this way on the second cohort. When we now look into regression estimates, and regression estimates for compounds that have 95% credibility intervals not reaching the zero level, so meaning clearly either above or beyond uh, the zero, meaning higher in MECFS or higher in controls, what we then see is that we have a number of triacyglycerides, again, with long chain and unsaturated fatty acids and that are in, uh, increased in the MECFS patients and many, many compounds, specifically plasmologens and lysophosphatidylcholines, as well as some ceramides that are decreased in the MECFS patients. In addition, we see differences in carnitines, we see differences in uh, behavior like food and compounds. So overall, we, we get much clearer idea now with regression estimates on what's different than with, with classic statistics. We can now import that into chemical set enrichment statistics. And now we see a very clear differences in unsaturated long chain fatty acids, uh, tri triacyglycerides, decreases in prostaglandins, decreases or mixed effects in um, other types of um, oxylipins, with some increases, some decreases, a lot of decreased values or modules on ranges of complex lipids, the most important ones being plasmologens. And the ball size is a number of, of compounds that are different um, in each set. So let's look at the metabolic implications. In the MECFS cohort, we saw some TCA metabolites like succinate, alpha gated derived being increased, a few free fatty acids being increased, some acylcarnitines, specifically branched and short chain uh, acylcarnitines being decreased. And when we compare this to the first cohort, the Nagi Sagal cohort, again, there we also saw some decreases in odd chain fatty acid um, acylcarnitines in addition to carnitine itself. It's a, I would call it a weak evidence for mitochondrial function at this case, but maybe there's another hypothesis we can glean from that. Secondly, we see metabolic mediators sphingomyelins as well as a lot of um, oxylipins being differentiated. And again, sphingomyelins and ceramides when we uh, combine both IBS and non-IBS patients in the Nagi Sagal cohort, we also some some evidence, not very strong, but some evidence in that cohort. Exposure compounds, we have now largely improved. We didn't have many data on that in the first cohort, but we see clearly higher medication because they're patients, of course, higher vegetable intakes, for example, soy-based um, foods, as well as less coffee and pepper consumptions because these patients have pain. Most interestingly, we see decreases in polyunsaturated fatty acid plasmologens, polyunsaturated fatty acid containing phosphorylcholines, and increases in polyunsaturated fatty acid containing triacyglycerides. And again, in the first cohort, the Nagi Sagal cohort, we saw the exact same thing. That means we are now much more confident to put these evidence into specific hypotheses. So the first hypothesis that could come to mind is, of course, some kind of differences in the activity of polyunsaturated fatty acid specific phospholipases. When you look at the literature, there are some in indications, for example, mast cells that would recruit DAC l beta, which is a phospholipase that is very specific for triacyglycerides, that it could be one way of, of how we can explain these findings. Another way would be phospholipase C beta and A2 that might be different. And again, this is how polyunsaturated fatty acids are used for signaling because these um, would then be used for downstream synthesis of oxylipids. So this is one, one, one hypothesis. However, we think our data points much more, much stronger to a secondary hypothesis that what we see in MECFS patients 
are peroxisome dysfunctions. Peroxisomes are organelles that have been mostly ignored by, in biology, although Amir Hira and colleagues since 1977 have done a lot of different studies on it. Peroxisomes are organelles that specifically work on very long chain fatty acyl coase and branch chain or chain fatty acyl coase and their carnitines for import. They also are the ones that pr um, produce the isolipids for the precursor for plasmologens biosynthesis, where then the alkyl chains are finalized in the endo endoplasmic reticulum. So we have these three different types of evidence that all said we have long chain fatty acids that are impaired, we have branch chain carnitines that are impaired, and we have the plasmologens as most important uh, compound class being different, all pointing towards peroxisomes. Secondly, we see differences now in downstream compounds that are made from polyunsaturated fatty acids. Here is now the arachidonal cascade, and we see the increases in 1112E, which is involved in regulation of cerebral circulation, perhaps influencing, therefore, the difference or the, the blood flow in the brain and therefore contributing to what the patients experience as brain fog. We see also decreases in PGF2, an important compound in control of blood pressure. And again, this was one of the most important characteristics of MECFS in the lean test. Again, maybe also controlling the blood flow in the um, brain again. PGD2, a control of pain responses. And again, this is one of the hallmarks of MECFS patients. So in addition, of course, we see a 89E uh, being downregulated. It's activating several very well-known signaling pathways, nuclear signaling pathways. Secondly, in the EPA pathway, 20 to 5, we see uh, different increases in response in MECFS towards inflammation, maybe as a resolving of perhaps of viral infections that are underlying uh, um, causes of MECFS. But also these uh, 12 heat, for example, attenuates serotonin release and again, perhaps in influencing differences in brain perception and pain, both pain uh, as well as brain fog. The last one in the DHA cascade, we saw a decreases in resolvin D1, again, influencing inflammatory pathways. Overall, we have seen some evidence, but fairly weak evidence that the uh, single myelids and ceramides are involved as well in MECFS pathobiology. These ceramides are also involved in cell differential proliferations, but possibly even inflammation. So that is another way how signaling could um, occur in, in, in differentiation of MECFS to regular controls. So in concluding, I've given you two case control studies, retrospective case control, uh, control studies with over 900 identified metabolites. I have introduced to you to Bayesian uh, factor analysis, regression uh, factor analysis, and enrichment statistics, all pointing towards lipid dysregulations. Earlier findings are largely confirmed from our first studies. We see polyunsaturated fatty acid rich lipids pointing to perhaps to specific lipase activities, but more likely to peroxisome dysfunction. And we see oxalip uh, oxalipins dysregulated, many with potential and known potent physiological functions. We continue this with detailed statistics and interpretation of the R56 cohort data. We, start having, we have started with the pre post exertion samples there, where we, by the way, did not find any differences in lactate so, so to, towards mitochondrial dysfunctions. And we will continue this also for other viral diseases, including long COVID. I would like to thank all my collaborators. This is, team is led by Ian Press, Ian Lipkin at Columbia University, Lucinda Bateman at uh, Salt Lake City, and I uh, thank my statistician Christopher Bridges at UC Davis, Jason Che at Columbia Universities, and both teams at UC Davis and Columbia. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Oliver. It was very impressive.